Hello everyone, this is Yuris Trivia, and today we're starting our Age of Empires 4 campaign coverage as we're going to kick things off with the Mongol Empires campaign. So at launch, um, there are four single player campaigns for the game. The Normans, uh, Invasion of England, the Hundred Year War, the Mongol Empire, and the Rise of Moscow. And of these, I am particularly interested in the Mongol Empire storyline. Uh, not only are the Mongol faction in the game quite interesting to play with their mobile buildings, uh, they're essentially all tents that you can pack up and move, but also historically this is the slice of history that I am probably most familiar with as the Mongols did go on to establish the Yuan Dynasty in China. So um, I am quite familiar uh, with the founding story here, although the game's take on this is actually quite different. We're starting with this first battle here in the year 1223, the Battle of the Kalka River, and it goes all the way down the timeline to the battle in Xiangyang in 1273. Now, for those who follow Three Kingdom content on my channel, Xiangyang is the city that Liu Bell is stationed in for Total War Three Kingdoms, and it is a crucial city in the defense against the Mongol invasion at the end of the Song Dynasty. Uh, reason being, it's sort of the middle choke point on the Yangtze River, as the Song Dynasty have already retreated south past the Yangtze River uh, to defend pretty much only half of China after being invaded by uh, factions like Liao, Jin, and finally the Mongols. Um, but in 1223, the Mongols have not invaded uh, China yet. They are doing battle in northern China with the Jin Dynasty, which is another nomadic culture that invaded China earlier and sort of uh, replaced the Song Dynasty in the north. And as the Mongols grew, uh, they hoped to do trade with uh, empire in what's ancient Persia. Uh, in Chinese, we called them uh, Bulatzimo. Um, they are pretty much situated in modern day uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, um, even extending as far as uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, that area in the Middle East. And they were quite a large empire, but not super strong. But the Mongols didn't know this. Uh, when the Mongols finished their uh, central attack against the Jin capital, they turned their attention west and sent a 450-member delegation of trade um, caravan to go to uh, this uh, kingdom out west to kind of re-establish the Silk Road, to have trade with the west. And this delegation was sent because Genghis Khan, the leader of the Mongols, had a verbal agreement with the king of Blatsimo. But they backstabbed their... Well, they, they didn't backstab their words. What they did was the local administrator or the local mayor of the town that the caravan walked through got greedy because uh, the Mongols made a really big effort to open up this trade route with this huge caravan carrying tons of gold, silk, goods they have looted from um, the east to kind of open up trade. And the local guards uh, got greedy and murdered all 450 except for a few people who escaped and took all the goods. And this was against the wish of their own king. But the Mongols didn't care about this. so. The people that escaped reported back to Genghis Khan, and he was furious. Uh, if you have any experience with Mongol history during this part of their expansion, uh, they pretty much are merciless to people who kill envoys. If they send an envoy to you, and you kill their envoy, then expect your city to get absolutely massacred when they capture it. No one will be spared. But if you pay up the gold at the start when the envoy gets to your town or city, then it's likely that you will be spared, but not always a guarantee, even in that situation. So when you have a trade delegation of 450, all getting murdered, goods getting seized, obviously the Mongols are going to be very angry. But before they turn to war, uh, Genghis Khan actually sent three more diplomats to travel to the king. Um, to actually talk with him, saying that, you know, if you claim that you're not responsible for this, turn over the general or 
uh, the administrator that is responsible for this, let us take care of that person, and this will be forgiven. But unfortunately, uh, this kingdom, which stretches pretty much, if you want to think about landmass, of what ancient Persia uh, kind of sits on, they're not Persians by any means, right? I think ethnic, um, in terms of ethnicity, they're closer to what modern-day Uzbekistan um, are. And what they did is they shaved the head of the delegates and diplomats and sent them back. And this was supposed to disgrace uh, the Mongol Empire. So that started the first Western campaign and probably the only Western campaign led by Genghis Khan because he was quite old this time. I think Genghis Khan only lives till 1227. Uh, so this is ready after the Mongols have united their tribes and grew into a massive uh, power. Um, but in 220, I think 221 actually, um, Genghis Khan launched his first Western campaign. Uh, his only one, but the Mongol Empire will launch many more Western campaigns. And they brought, I think, 230,000 um, strong army uh, to march west. And they pretty much tore apart this empire. Uh, it took them about two years. Uh, they chased the king all over the place. I think the king eventually died on the road due to sickness. His son took over and the Mongols chased his son all over the place until the son actually, I believe, escaped into uh, India uh, and married one of the daughters of the Delhi Sultanate uh, because um, the Mongols had already invaded northern India, didn't really like the climate and backed off. So he escaped over there. Uh, but this entire area stretching from uh, almost modern day, you know, the almost reaching the Mediterranean, uh, basically got conquered by the Mongol Empire. Many, many cities were massacred. Um, millions, I think there was one big city uh, close to the Caspian Sea. I think it had like 1.3 million population. I think except 40 people who were artisans uh, all got murdered. And by artisans, I mean people who are like blacksmith, uh, who has a craft that can help the army. Those people are spared, but became slaves to uh, the royal household. So the sons of the great Khan would have them as slaves, they would help serve the army and so forth, and uh, the conquest continued. And after this great empire fell, there were all these remnant factions around um, that needed to be cleaned up, but Genghis Khan didn't want to stay here anymore, so he took the main army and left. He went back east, uh, there was still a war uh, to be had with um, uh, Liao. There was still a small piece of Liao and as well as the Jin uh, dynasty in northern China. So he went back and he left behind um, two generals with 20,000 men to clean up a small faction uh, around uh, what we have in the Caspian, uh, the road leading up towards Ukraine, modern day Ukraine. And this is where we uh, kick things off. So we'll start this mission um, as we uh, start out out west that's pretty much all the background we have uh, leading up to this there's a little bit more details i'll share and you see here the cool thing about uh, age empire 4 is they did a lot of really cool documentary style videos about these battles about the army the units the armor they used and we'll definitely unlock these and check them out at the end as sort of a little reward for us From the vast reaches of the Mongolian steppe, an army of over 100,000 men swept aside all resistance, claiming territories that spanned continents. Their leader, Genghis Khan, proclaimed his life's ambition was to unite the world under one empire. Having conquered the East, the Mongols turned their attention to the west, where they would come face to face with some of the greatest armies of medieval Europe. Would Genghis Khan's legendary warriors finally meet their match?
By 1221, the Mongols have taken cities throughout Asia, generating vast amounts of tribute from those they conquered. The West, however, was still an untapped resource. Genghis Khan sent his trusted generals, Jebe and Subutai, to attack Europe. With an army of 20,000, Jebe and Subutai took the West by surprise, raiding cities and destroying armies. Within two years, they had the prosperous Rus territories in their sights. But in their way was a Rus army of over 40,000 men. Outnumbered, Jebe and Subutai turned and started to head back east. The Rus sensed an easy victory and set off in pursuit of their retreating enemies. For eight days, the fast-moving Mongols stayed just out of reach. Then, Jebe and Subutai set their trap. They lured the Rus across the Kalka River and turned to fight. The Rus had fallen for one of the Mongols' most effective tactics, the feigned retreat. The stage was set for the Mongol army to test themselves against Europe's finest. Okay, there's a lot of simplifications and uh, over-exaggeration in that, but um, let's see. So we're on the load screen, and the two general here, um, I'm going to call them by their Chinese name, just because I think it's slightly closer to the Mongolian pronunciation, but this would be Su Butai, right? Su Butai is one of the four hounds of Genghis Khan, um, the other uh, being Zhuo Bie, who is also in this army. And there's two more who did not participate in this battle. Uh, as I mentioned before, there was this huge, massive campaign uh, in the Middle East. And these two generals were left with 20,000 men to clean up some of the minor factions in this region. They were chasing a leader, a tribal leader from what we call the Kuman tribe. And this tribe, I think, is closer to modern day Kipchak. Um, and they escaped north because they were in laws with. Uh, the Rus, right? The, the Rus lords. Right now, we don't have Russian. We have a bunch of confederation of different princes. And one of these uh, lords is Mist, uh, Mistilov of Kiev. And there's also Mistilov of uh, Giplek. I think Mistilov is a rather common name for them. Um, but they formed a confederation uh, with many, many uh, of the southern Rus tribes. Or not tribes, let's call them princedoms. And they gathered up an uh, army that totaled 80,000, but not all 80,000 were present at the battle because you muster the troops and you have to gather them. But like the video said, you had close to 40,000 on the battlefield facing off against um, Su Butai and Zhuo armies. And in the first exchange that they had, um, Su Butai realized that they had not enough men to fight this battle. So what they did is they sent a delegation of 10 people says that we have no intentions of conquering the Rus. We're here just to chase after uh, the people who had wronged us in our campaign against this uh, empire down in the you know, Middle East. They escaped here, turned them over, and we'll, we'll leave. That's the statement. Obviously, uh, this confederation of the Rus army felt very confident about their chances, they killed these 10 delegates. And if we learn anything so far, you don't really want to kill uh, Mongol env uh, the envoys. You don't also want to kill their princes. Um, there was a battle in the Middle East where one of the, not the prince, but the son-in-law to the Khan, uh, his daughter's husband, actually got killed in a siege. And after they won, uh, the daughter, uh, the princess, uh, got to take her men into the city to kill as many as she pleased. Um, yes, not a very uh, good place to be in this time period. Uh, but essentially what happened in this battle is they refused peace, so they fought. Uh, at first, not at Kauka River, but at a river 
about uh, eight days ride away, as the video suggested. And in this fight, uh, the Mongols uh, did practice their fame retreat. They did not want to fight there. They had actually sent a message to the crown prince at the time. Um, I think his name is Shu Chi, and asking for reinforcements because Shu Chi was close by. It was still stationed relatively close, and they could probably get another 10,000 men. Uh, wouldn't really turn the tide. They would never have the numbers advantage in this battle, uh, but they were hoping to get some uh, reinforcement to join the fight as they started pulling east. And in their retreat, they decided to put one of their vanguard generals as the rear guard to cut off uh, the pursuit. And this rear guard got absolutely wiped by the, uh, the Rus confederation that they had, and uh, they killed this vanguard general, which really bolstered the morale of the Rus side as they continued to chase. Uh, but they had a lot of trouble catching up to the Mongol army. And by the time they met at the Kalka River, the Mongols had just received those reinforcements as they prepared to fight at this river, as well as um, the pursuit kind of created a lag between the 40,000 men that was on the front line and the 40,000 more men that was supposed to come reinforce. So the 40,000 um, reinforcement party, representing most of the northern uh, Rus uh, princedoms never made it to the battle. So this 40,000 that they had is a confederation of some of the southern uh, Rus princedom plus those tribes we talked about, uh, the Kuman tribes. And they fought at this battle. And in this battle, uh, they were effectively uh, sort of cut off because uh, you can think of the terrain as multiple rivers running across the battlefield and one of the Mistilovs, uh, not of Kiev, had a disagreement. He was slightly older. Uh, he was a duke. I think he was slightly older than uh, the, the the Kiev um, Mistilov at the time, and they had an argument. So uh, he didn't really want to help. So you can think of this army as sort of a loose confederation of princedom with different interests. So he decided to build this palisade on the north part of the riverbank, thinking that they will have a defensive position. And he refused to cross the river to aid the rest of them as the rest of them got turned on by the Mongol army, which suddenly wanted to fight. And they got ran down, especially uh, the Kuman uh, tribes that joined them. They experienced how powerful the Mongols are. They fled uh, when the Mongols did their charge and they overran uh, the Rus encampment that was set up behind them, creating this massive confusion. And they absolutely just got slaughtered as reinforcement looked on, uh, not budging. I think this battle, uh, the casualties, at least recorded down in history, is about twenty to 30,000 of the Rus Confederation troops absolutely destroyed. And the casualty number for the Mongols uh, was very few. Uh, that's how they recorded it. So uh, negligible uh, casualties as the cavalry just outmaneuvered and absolutely ran down troops that were just massively routing. And after they crushed this group, right, you still had that northern force, uh, that's reinforcement that's still a couple uh, distance away, as, so, as well as uh, the other Mistilov duke who was in a palisade to the north of the bank. Um, well, they're in trouble now, and they negotiated peace with the Mongols. He said, we'll surrender, and the Mongols agreed, but the Mongols took back their word. They did not honor this peace. They grabbed uh, that um, duke along with his two sons, wrapped them up in a carpet, placed them underneath the tent as the camp hosted the celebration for the victory. So basically, you're kind of wrapped in a very tight carpet, placed under a tent like logs, and people will just step on you and drink and party above you until you slowly died uh, from being stepped on too much. Um, that's their fate. I think overall the battle uh, was recorded about seven Rus princes died on the field, and 70 more captured and executed afterward. Um, absolutely devastated the Southern Rus and the Northern Rus army reinforcements saw the defeat and just turned around. And then uh, Subotai and uh, Jobiet cleaned up uh, the Southern Rus areas. Um, their 20,000 men, I think they, they wiped out many, many kingdoms in their campaign. Very, very impressive. And a little bit more about the generals before we jump into gameplay. Um, sorry, a lot of, little history facts to share. But Subotai is probably uh, historically acknowledged as the general who traversed the most landmass in his entire life. 
He had campaigns in Korea, and he had campaigns all the way in into Hungary and Poland. Like that's how far he spanned during his lifetime. Uh, you know, fighting. Um, probably acknowledged to be the general who fought across the most distance. Uh, even if you take into consideration of modern uh, campaigns where you have better transportation, still no general led armies across that span of distance. And the general we didn't really talk about that much, Zhuo Bie. Um, he's actually super popular in China, uh, mainly because he was fictionalized and written into a Jin Yong martial arts novel as the main character's teacher, as the main character grew up with the Mongols. And Zhuo Bie is a gifted name. He did not born with that name. He was the enemy of Genghis Khan in Genghis Khan's early days and actually uh, shot Genghis Khan's horse. Uh, Genghis Khan has like a prize horse, which is a white horse with a like yellow mouth. And uh, he shot the horse in the neck and killed the horse, threw the Khan off on the battlefield. Afterward, the Khan won and captured him, well, captured everyone, said, who killed my horse? He came out and said, I did. And... Um, he said, but if you don't kill me, I'll offer you my service. And he worked his way from a captain of 10 people, Shi Fu Zhang, all the way to a captain of 1,000 people, eventually became one of these key generals, also one of the four hounds of the Khan, basically the four most trusted uh, vanguard generals. And um, his name, Zhuo Bie, is actually a nickname given to him, or a, not a nickname, but a name given to him by the Khan. And in Mongolian, it means the will of the arrow because he was a very, very talented archer. Um, he would die, sadly, pretty soon after this battle. He was quite old. I think on the way back east in 224, I think he dies of old age. Um, but that's pretty much all we need to know about this battle. Let's actually play it. The Mongols charged across the European plains with the fatigued Rus army in close pursuit. Guess we're in blue. The Rus had fallen for the Mongol tactic of the feigned retreat and unknowingly followed them into peril. The Mongol general sprung his trap on the enemy scouts. With the Rus scouts cut down, General Subutai crossed the Kalka River. Here, he would stage a full-scale ambush on the vast Rus army. Subutai directed his warriors to split up and lie in wait for the enemy. There is uh, going to be some tutorials involved, um, as we are relatively new to the game. I played a few, but uh, we got about a minute time, so basically we're supposed to divide up the army. I'll lead the main force here, I guess. Well, them um, six, I guess. And there should be a special ability on your leader general uh, for the campaign only. Obviously, if you play just the AI map, you don't get generals and all that good stuff. Signal arrow increase the movement of nearby uh, units. Attack speed arrow increase the reload speed of range units. Master tactician increase line of sight rapidly recharge. For Subutai's strategy to be effective, he needed to spring his trap before the Rus recovered from their long pursuit. Okay, let's use some units to lure them over. Let's he sent use his most uh, fearsome four. Bangadai horse archers oh. to draw the Rus quickly towards the ambush site. These are horse archers, I believe. These highly no. skilled warriors could fire their bows Lance. rapidly while no. riding at speed. Lance. Which one? Uh, we'll figure it out. I think these are the horse archers, right? All right I'm going six, six. I'm going with you guys. We're supposed to lure them in, basically kite them. I think the way the game did the historical setup for the campaign is basically to 
So let's fight. I think we're supposed to kite back. We can fire while moving. Is so that the they can fight all the factions. And the ruse hastily pursued. Come, come follow us. Follow us. Three. Right to charge. Cut them off. Oh. It's like I did all the hotkeys, but I don't remember the hotkeys. And rode straight into the Ooh, Mongol ambush. Is that archers? With the enemy surrounded, super ties, battle ready warriors descended from all sides. Yeah, we got the front lines in there. I'm gonna have to micro them. They're probably the most useful group. We gotta break through the back. Come, 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 come. Five charge over here. I have to try to kill the archers. Three. Like, we want to avoid fighting these spearmen and just somehow charge over here. I mean, I can tank a lot of damage, I guess. We should be getting reinforcements as well. In campaign, you don't like not all campaign maps are base building. Like this one, I don't think we'll be building any bases. Yeah, we should have tried to surround these archers a little bit better. Would have reduced our losses. But uh, it's fine. The Mongol ambush was devastating, and Rus numbers were reduced to a few desperate stragglers. Seeing the fate of their comrades. The last ruse encircled themselves in a makeshift fort of baggage carts. Let's go chase. We still have our cavalry, uh, range cavalry. Just that we lost a lot of our melee ones. Alright, that's the baggage cart. Ooh, that's a lot of units. Hold on. We need to kite? No, 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 no. Attack move doesn't work because, uh. I actually want everyone. I only want six to move out. Right, we only want to harass. Alright, get the archers if we can. Uh, we, need to, we need to coordinate this a little bit better. Six will be here. I'm gonna give all of these like a different number. Alright, so we wanna lure these out. We don't wanna fight them there. We almost wanna dive back in, but we can't. Uh, this is a mess. Alright, we want these group to go here. Surround the enemy. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Got the enemy archers. That's who we need to kill. And those we can just always kite. Once we kill the archers, it's all good. They can tank it for us a little bit. No more archers.
the Rus stockade fell. Despite a valiant last stand, the remnants of the Rus army were cut down. Spurred on by the crushing victory at the Kalka River, the Mongols advanced ever further into the heartland of the Rus. Alright, pretty snazzy campaign. Uh, the campaign gameplay, it's nothing to gloat about, and I think the controls is a little bit dated. It's very similar to what Age of Empire 2 was. Um, but the storyline and the videos we unlock is really what this is all about. So I think this is the one that we saw at the beginning, right? So there's no need to rewatch this one. Uh, basically, we have it to watch in the future. But this is new. This is a little bit of a, a cultural aspect that's unlocked. In the noise and confusion of battle, communications were vital. One solution was the use of message arrows. Signal arrows could be used to send messages to your drone troops. Faster than a man, faster than a horse. It was the quickest way to communicate in the heat of battle. Whistling arrows were blunt, and most importantly, they announced their arrival. But they weren't just used to pass written messages. When shot in a volley, whistling arrows could be loud enough to signal to a small group of warriors, telling them both where and when to attack. On hearing the sound, they would gallop in and strike where the arrows landed. However, a much louder sound was required to sound the retreat or to communicate to the whole army. That was the job of the war drums. Mongols also used gongs. And the combinations of drums and gongs gave the Mongols a wide array of signaling options. We do not know the exact rhythms they used, but basic commands could be conveyed with different percussive patterns. They enabled the Mongols to communicate with their own forces and strike fear into the enemy. They were the heartbeat of the Mongol army. Right, those things are really, really neat. And a little bit about that, um, at least for Chinese armies I know, uh, which do share a lot of uh, historical connections with the Mongol army here, um, drums are usually meant for charging, and the gongs uh, is always uh, meant for retreating. Um, Mingjing, right, that statement in Chinese means hitting the gongs, that's when you retreat. Um, and it's a very crisp sound that's very easy to pass along. Uh, but overall, this has been quite nice. Uh, we'll come back tomorrow and play the next one. So hopefully you guys enjoy this one and see you guys then. Bye.